Since 2017, Alison has been Chief Executive Officer, CAO of the Public Library of Science PLOS, an organisation that dedicates is dedicated to advancing equitable open science for the benefit of everyone everywhere. Prior to PLOS, Alison served as a director of the University of California Press and as Executive Vice President of SAGE Publications. Alison is chair of the board of directors for the Center of Open Science and also serves on the board of NISO and the American Chemical Society's governing body board for publishing. Alison. Thanks so much, Jane, for, for the introduction and hello to everybody over in the UK. I actually spent the first part of this week in Cambridge, Massachusetts at the MIT Libraries Board meeting. So I feel as if I spent my whole week immersed in um, the world of libraries and building open, equitable scholarship. Um, so being with you today is a great way for me to bookend my week. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity to share my thoughts on these issues with you today. And so what I, what I want to do today is to try to weave together an assessment of where scientific publishing finds itself, what prevents it changing more radically, and how we can carve out that more sort of radical pathway in the, to create a system that better serves us all. But just before I sort of dive into that, I wanted to um, make a quick note on terminology. I'm going to be using the term open science a lot today, but I want to be clear that I do that in, the, in its broadest sense. PLOS itself is focused primarily in the sciences, but I know all too well from my years leading the University of California Press that, that the arts and humanities have unique and different needs, and I, I certainly don't mean to undervalue those um, in the terminology I'm using. So this will move forward. So I want to start with an assessment of, of where open access finds itself at, at this point in time. And if we sort of look back to the to the origins of the open access movement, it was primarily focused as a movement on focused on achieving open access to research articles. And looking at PLOS's history back in 2003, our founders aimed to catalyze a revolution um, in scientific publishing. They wanted to, and this is a direct quote from uh, the, the founding uh, documents, the goal was to eliminate monopolies over essential published results, diminish profit margins, and create a more efficient market for scientific publishing. And I don't think they were alone in having pretty ambitious aims for open access and pretty high-minded aims in, in some ways. And so I think 20 years on, it's worth reflecting on, on how well we're doing there. There's been quite a bit of discussion about this recently. And I think while we can certainly see progress, you know, for example, Delta Fink's annual market sizing back in 2022 indicates that over 50% of um, publications that year were open access. But in spite of that progress, I think that rather than achieving this greater equity and a focus on making research freely available to all, the elimination of monopolies and a more efficient market, what we've arguably ended up with is the establishment or, you know, in many ways, the entrenchment of APCs as the dominant business model, which in turn is pushing up costs the continued dominance of big deals through so-called transformative or transitional agreements, a consolidation in the market. And just two weeks ago, we saw another independent nonprofit publisher exit when PJ was acquired by Taylor and Francis. And the economic barriers to participation that prevented people from reading have now become barriers to knowledge sharing itself. Overall, I think at this point, my primary concern is that this high-minded transition to open access has shifted from being this movement for systemic change to becoming more of a business model for supporting the status quo. But during the pandemic, we were really exposed to a very different model of what's possible. We saw global scientific collaboration on an unprecedented scale, thousands of scientists across the globe focused urgently on this single problem. And that also forced some critical breakthroughs for scientific publishing. Information that had been previously locked behind paywalls was opened globally. Results were shared immediately. Preprints and other forms of online sharing became the norm. And even in academia, the usual secrecy and hoarding of data for future publications and grants and so on was really eroded by, by the urgency of the moment. All of that happened because in many ways it was a matter of survival for all of us. 
But the fundamental flaws of the way in which research is traditionally shared was also laid bare during the pandemic. And I think they clearly illustrated the need for this more radical change that I mentioned earlier, particularly in the ways in which we share and communicate the results of research. The accessible publication, not only of the research, but of data and ideas arising from research is a pretty fundamental part of how science functions and ultimately advances. But unfortunately, it's pretty different from the way in which the system works today. And I think without this more radical change that I've talked about, the potential impacts here, the potential negative impacts spread well beyond the research enterprise itself. One that I find very much on my mind these days is this continuing erosion of trust in science and expertise that we see. At a societal level, those two things, that trust and expertise and the confidence in science are critical if we're to be able to tackle all of the huge problems that our world faces today. And there are ways in which we saw during the pandemic, again, the sort of lack of public understanding in science was a big contributor. The solution isn't simply to put science back in its black box. But achieving this kind of systems change is, is pretty hard and it's really complex. There are plenty of people, mainly those who've benefited from the current system, who think it's just fine as it is. And unfortunately, a lot of those people who really want to make change, such as early career researchers, lack the power and influence to do so. There's still a wide recognition of the problems, but the overall system for changing how we publish science has just not really, it hasn't changed much, even in the digital age. Now, I think there are definitely commercial drivers at work. For many publishers, radical change is a threat to what's been a pretty profitable business model for many years, and they obviously want to protect that. But publishers also operate in a conservative system, and change is slow, and it's blocked in large part by a pretty broken system of rewards and incentives for researchers themselves. Most established researchers have been working in these closed ways for, you know, for years, for even for decades. And changing those habits really requires some upfront time and effort. There are ways in which new technologies are helping us with that, um, but it's ultimately behavioral change and that's really hard. Scientists are just like all of us. They tend to repeat the behaviors that are reinforced and rewarded. And given the profusion of demands on their time for review of papers, reviews for grants, reviews for promotions, it's all too easy to fall back on biased proxy measures like journal impact factor. And so the challenges associated with changing these systems, like, you know, at times I think you can feel pretty overwhelming. It's a, this kind of change is something that's really going to require many of us working together over an extended period of time. But that absolutely doesn't mean that it's not possible. And it's the reason why I joined PLOS seven years ago, an organization that exists to advance equitable open science for the benefit of everyone everywhere. We've never been driven by tradition, but I think by a willingness to really question the status quo and an eagerness to explore the ways in which we can change things and make it better. Over the recent years, we've really moved from a focus more narrowly on open access itself to focus on building the full open science ecosystem, because open has to be about more than just reading an article. It's about providing the right context to be able to understand it and the information and resources to replicate it, in particular access to the underpinning components of the research itself. But just as importantly, our focus is also and very squarely on equitable participation in knowledge creation and sharing. We need to really intentionally address the power imbalances and the legacy of devaluing knowledge from different groups of researchers and different communities. At its core, open science itself is really about culture change. It's about changing the way in which researchers work, but it's not simply for its own sake for its own sake. Um, Audrey Azule, who's the UNESCO um, Director General, has described open science as the science we need for the future we want. So how does it work? Open science produces work that's more reliable, and it's more reliable because we have access to more than the article itself. We can see the underlying data, the codes, the methods, which makes it possible not only to check those, but it makes it easier to replicate the work. And just as it did during COVID, it makes science faster and more efficient because the outputs themselves are reusable, but also we don't waste time on dead ends because we share the studies that didn't work as well as the ones that did. 
And this broader inclusion across different research communities ensures that the research meets the needs of more communities and it's more trusted through its transparency. But science alone, open science alone, can't deliver all of this. There are, you know, I've touched on this before, but there are some really key system changes that have to happen in parallel for us to be able to realize these benefits. And the first of those is that we need a different and better process for the evaluation of research. One that understands that science is an evolving and self-correcting process. It's not just a set of facts. We also need different and better incentives and rewards for researchers, ones that reward and value collaboration and teamwork, as well as the traditional ways in which we tended to evaluate research. And finally, we need models that are equitable, inclusive, and sustainable. One of the overarching lessons from the work that PLOS has done over the years is that all too often we're dealing with challenges that aren't really technological in, in nature. And so the solution isn't simply about building more technology or building more new systems. Um, there's one really good concrete example of this. Um, a lot of our re internal research shows that scientists are, are pretty happy with the systems that are available and the options available for the, to share their data, things like Figshare and so on. But most of them don't share their data. So the solution here clearly isn't about building more systems. I think there are a number of things going on here. The process of sharing is messy. It takes time. Some scientists aren't confident in how to do it. But as we've already learned, if there's no reward, busy scientists simply aren't going to take the time to engage in these behaviours. And so much of our thinking at PLOS as we think about this behavioural change has been informed by the classic theory of diffusion of innovation that was developed by, by E.M. Rogers back in the early 60s. And you know, essentially, this theory states that the adoption of any new ideas, behaviors of products doesn't happen simultaneously. There are some of us who are more rapid adopters and others who, who take longer to, to adapt, if you like. And so we, we've been using that to inform a sort of portfolio based approach where we focus on innovators and early adopters um, for some things. But if we really want change to happen, we have to be thinking about how we bring bring, bring along that sort of bigger long tail of, of people who are more skeptical about change. And we found that um, offering new features on our journals, which is a format they're much more comfortable with, um, is likely to be more successful. And so one, um, one brief recent example of that is an experiment we did with code sharing in our journal plus computational biology. Um, we spoke to a lot of researchers in the field and we heard that code sharing, um, it, it signals confidence, it signals integrity on behalf of the authors, but also authors expressed a willingness to open doors for their, for their fellow researchers by enabling them to reuse their own code and scripts in a way that would, you know, help them advance their own studies and, you know, ultimately the field, field as a whole. And so we saw that there was an opportunity to sort of shift behavior here by piloting a new policy, which required journals to make public all of the code that was associated with the results of their article on publication. And, you know, we had pretty good rate of code sharing before this policy was introduced. It was just over 50%. But after we introduced the policy, we've seen that number jump to 90%. And so that's been enough for us to make this a, a permanent policy. One of the other areas that, that we um, focus on is how we can use data to understand progress towards the goals of the open science practices that, that we're targeting and, and to really understand how, how the adoption differs across a different groups of, of researchers. Um, one example of this is, is the one you, you see on the slide here. Um, in partnership with Dataseer, we've developed a novel AI supported information source to, to help us meet those needs. And we've called that our open science indicators. And so those, those are forming really useful business intelligence for us internally at PLOS. But they, we've also made them available to support organizations beyond PLOS who, PLOS who may have um, you know, similar needs to uh, understand the ways in which open science practice is, is evolving in their institutions, you know, things like data and code and preprint sharing. And so the, the data set currently includes um, an analysis of over 100,000 articles, those PLOS articles, but also a growing sample of other publishers' content. We're updating that every quarter. And as I said, using it to sort of monitor trends and, and assess impact. 
And fairly recently, um, we began a, a, a pilot partnership um, with UK, uh, a number of UK institutions through the UK Reproducibility Network, network to, um, to pilot um, and co-develop and test these indicators of open research and see if they help understand the effects of those institutional open science policies and can help improve um, and support improvements in practice in that way there. But I want to turn now and spend some time on issues that you know, for PLOS are really critical to the way in which we're thinking about the evolution and development of open science. Far too much of the discussion about open access and now open science has, has framed problems in the context of the global north. But really, these are global problems. And so that's why we've had a pretty heavy emphasis on supporting models that are going to expand global recognition and inclusion. There was a study um, that was released a couple of years ago, I think, by the International Network for the Availability of Scientific Publications, which wanted to sort of understand the challenges and opportunities for, for open access in lower and middle income countries. And what they found was that while stakeholders clearly believe that they benefit from open access in, in many ways, and particularly and obviously access to the content itself, there's a picture that emerges that's a lot more complicated. There's a clear conflict between the desire they have to, to strengthen their own local platforms, which often better serve their local needs, but they also feel pulled to play this game in which all of the norms have been set in the global north. And so one way in which we've been uh, tackling these issues has been a, a new policy we introduced to improve transparency in the reporting of research that's being conducted in other countries. Um, this, this is a practice that's kind of become known as parachute science. Um, and what it describes is how researchers from, you know, often from wealthy Western institutions drop into foreign communities to carry out their field work. They spend a lot of time gathering data there and then head home without much engaging local researchers and particularly without acknowledging the contributions of the local researchers. It's a disparity that's been reported for as much as a couple of decades at this point. And there was one study I read that illustrated that only six and a half percent of research articles in general medical journals had a co-author from the study uh, from the country in which the study population lived. And so what we've done to try and address this is to introduce this policy that requires information about ethical, cultural and scientific considerations and about local engagement and authorship. We share all of that information with our editors and with our reviewers and ask them to make sure that the research meets our stringent standards for research integrity when they're reviewing the paper. It was a policy that we developed in close collaboration with those global research communities. And we're hoping that it helps to not only improve awareness of these issues, but will help us to develop further policies to, to support in, in different areas. And I'm, you know, I'm delighted to say that we've also had a, a couple of other publishers who've approached us to see how they can adopt this policy and roll it out for their journals. But I think perhaps the most important area where we've been focused over the last few years has been on trying to create business models that move us away from APCs. And um, you know, many of you will know that PLOS was one of the first open access publishers to introduce APCs 20 years ago. And I think back when PLOS was launched in those days and we were heavily focused in the biomedical sciences, I think this sort of idea of charging authors a fee to publish seemed, seemed pretty fair and reasonable. A lot of those authors were awarded you know, huge grants in some cases. And so if this, this nominal fee meant that anybody could read and reuse the research, it felt like it was a price worth paying. But with the benefit of hindsight, I think we failed to anticipate how successful APCs would become. You know, we failed to anticipate how commercial publishers would exploit them and how inequitable they would ultimately become. And so we feel that sort of continuing down this APC path will further disenfranchise a lot of researchers, especially in the global south. And it just risks deepening the, the equality that we've, we're have we already seeing. And so we, we've chosen a, a different pathway and over the past couple of years have been piloting a couple of new models. We launched Community Action Publishing in 2021. And this was really focused on trying to demonstrate that highly selective publishing, journals that have pretty high rejection rates, is possible without you know, some of those sort of pretty eye-watering APCs that you see from certain publishers. And so in this model, the in the in the model, the, the cost to publish is assessed 
both on the, the needs of the, the corresponding author as well as all of the contributing authors, which means that the, the cost of publishing is distributed um, more equitably across all of those institutions. The institutions commit to an annual flat fee, and that ensures that their researchers receive access to unlimited publishing in, in our highly selective titles. The other thing that we do here is that we cap our margins. So the more institutions that join this effort, the lower the costs become for everyone. We then, a couple of, um, couple of years ago, we added our global equity model, which was trying to solve a slightly different problem. Um, and what this model does is it also provides a pathway for institutions to cover the cost of unlimited publications for their authors and again to eliminate APCs. I think what, make, what makes this model different is that the fees for each, each institution are adjusted by World Bank Lending Tier Group to be more reflective of the regional economy that the institution is based in. And so the GE model systematically acknowledges the economic differences that exists, and it's offering an appropriate solution to authors in those regions so that they don't have to ask for assistance. They're just included automatically. We do still offer a robust publication fee assistance program, but ultimately we hope that as our institutional partnerships expand, that's not going to be the only recourse that's available to so many researchers. It'll just be a backup option for those who, who aren't covered in other ways. But unfortunately, uh, we, we can't change this landscape on our own. It really needs a lot of engagement from other key stakeholders who control the funding flows in the scholarly communication ecosystem. And so that's why we've partnered with um, Coalition S and JISC to launch our Beyond Article-Based Charges initiative. We formed a multi-stakeholder working group and there are five main goals there. Th these include considering how APCs can be replaced by more equitable payment models, um, exploring how funds made available by research funders can be used to support open access in non-APC models, and making sure that we understand the possible unintended consequences of some of those changes. I also wanted to briefly address another um, key unintended consequence of APCs. And that's the growing challenge to research integrity that unfortunately we read about all too often in our, in our papers these days. OAs, uh, uh, open access itself and APCs are certainly not uniquely responsible for the problems that we see here. The publish or perish culture has an awful lot to answer for. But I think it's also true that the current model we have that's built on article publication is really incompatible with an ecosystem built on open science principles. And that's because it relies on and further embeds the article as the unit of value and the unit of reward. And what that does, and what we've seen, I think, is that it creates an article growth economy where the push is to just publish more and more. This article growth economy is unhelpful for openness, and I think it's ultimately unhelpful for science. And unfortunately, as a result of that, it's also become a sort of an accepted truth for many publishers that because APC funded OA has a lower per, art a lower per article profit margin, um, particularly than the subscription model did, it has to be a volume business. And so what that's created is this clear incentive for publishers to increase profit by pushing for article growth which has exacerbated this existing pressure on researchers to publish more, but it's also added significant pressures to the peer review system that was already uh, pretty strained there. And I think you know what we've seen over the last year or so with the fallout in Hindawi and the recent layoffs at Frontiers just highlights the fragility of an open access business model in which all of the, the kind of remuneration, if you like, is based on the volume of output. But I, I would also note here that I don't think publishers are the only ones who bear any responsibility here. I think there are others, including policymakers, funders, and yeah, even, even librarians who focus so heavily on cost reduction that makes it really challenging to invest in increasing rigor and editorial oversight. Now, I, I want to be really clear that I am not letting certain publishers off the hook for inflated APCs. But if I just look at this from PLOS's perspective, we're investing more and more in research integrity because of all these challenges and in expanding the open science features of our journals. And there's a cost to both of those things. But I think beyond the cost issue, there are two real concerns that I have um, about these challenges. 
the first comes back to something I was talking about um, earlier, the, the constant drip, drip, drip about research misconduct, retractions and so on, further undermines trust in science. And it's making it much easier for those with ill intent to, to weaponize that, if you like. And secondly, I think it starts to undermine the shift to open. Over the past few weeks, um, I've, you know, I heard a couple of people say to me that, you know, they felt that Wiley had been unfairly punished when its stock price dropped after the scale of the, the problems that Hindawi came out, because all they were doing um, in retracting the articles was they were doing the right thing for the scientific record. That, Personally, I think that's something of a distortion of what actually happened and doing the right thing would have involved much more rigorous editorial oversight so they didn't get to that point. But I've also heard other people suggest that given the ways in which open access has created this profiteering incentive, we should just go back to subscriptions. And so while I think these, these issues are complex and certainly, as I said, not simply about open access, I think we actually have to acknowledge and understand the connections between these things and the wider goals that we're trying to achieve. I want to spend my remaining time here um, looking at how we move forward. So let's start by looking at, at publishers. I don't think that the evolutionary change that we've seen are going to get us where we need to be fast enough. At the, the SDM conference I was at in October 2003, there was a panel of CEOs from some of the largest commercial publishers, and even they had to agree that scholarly publishing really hadn't changed that much as we've moved into the digital world. There, there are, of course, ways in which it has changed. Um, publishers have innovated in ways we've moved from print. There are lots more features that are available on our digital platforms that weren't available in print. But the problem is that all of this exists in exactly the same paradigm. We're still bound to this traditional model that was developed for print hundreds of years ago. And even at PLOS, while I'm pretty proud of what we've achieved in our first 23 years, our role has always been really to be that of a catalyst to sort of demonstrate what's possible for everyone. And so over the last year or so, we've been I mean, taking a deep dive to inform our next leap forward. We've spent a lot of time talking to four key groups of stakeholders, and those are researchers, university librarians, senior university administrators, and research funders. And in our interviews, we found some unifying values that, that people still, still appreciate from publishers. Um, I think the key one there is that the vetting and quality control. In other words, it's really important for them and their patron and, uh, to be able to know that Ultimately, someone I trust is telling me that this is worth my time. And um, peer review sits at the heart of that, the ways in which we carry out peer review is, is I think, changing, but peer review is an important part. And then a related part also is the sort of curation and discovery layers that are added by publishers, which again, sort of help to filter out all of the noise in our online world and surface content that's really worth the reader's time. But we also had a pretty strong convergence across those stakeholder groups about the ways in which the current publishing system is frustrating or, you know, at times even failing um, all of those core stakeholders. You know, I'll, I'll acknowledge that our, our sample was probably a little biased because we focused on conversations with people who were actively engaged in this transition to open. Um, but there are a couple that I'll, I'll highlight here. You know, first from the researchers, um, you know, we heard frustrations on multiple levels. But a lot of them sort of centered around this core issue of being being required to publish in ways that didn't really align with their core values and in many ways didn't always serve their, their research well. You know, in other words, they felt that they were sort of forced to, to publish in these sort of high impact vanity journals, if you like, because that was what was required to secure jobs and funding. And then there was an, a frustration we heard across many um, stakeholders that you know, something I touched on earlier, publishing processes haven't kept pace with modern research and haven't kept pace with modern technologies. And we still have this very traditional fixed idea of publication that doesn't account for, you know, the pace at which modern research moves and the, the need to sort of update it um, in, the, in the ways that we, we often do. And so, you know, at PLOS, we, we sort of come away from this with a, you know, a clear vision for a much more radical reframing of how research is, is shared, that's built on the, the principles of open science, that's built on, on rigor, on openness, and on equity. 
it's something we're now starting to make concrete as we move into the next phase of developing a model that incorporates the, fo the following principles. So we're looking to sort of shift away from, from the article as being sort of the sole center of attention. I don't think articles will disappear entirely at all. Um, but we want to make sure that we're surfacing sort of other research objects and that those are appropriately shared and assessed at, at different points in the research life cycle. We're also interested in demonstrating that the article itself doesn't have to be immutable and that conclusions may shift over time and we need to find ways to be able to take account of that. And we want to see the ways in which experiment, the ways in which peer review can evolve away from being this binary decision of accepting or rejecting the publication to being a much more nuanced assessment that's more useful to, to everyone. And all of that needs to be underpinned by equitable and sustainable business models. And finally, I, I want to tie all of this back to some direct implications and questions for research libraries as, as I see them. So my first, first question brings us back to business models again. European library budgeting and negotiating is still pretty heavily linked to the legacy of APCs and the, the cost per article model. And I know that there's been some discussion of the, the recent um, JISC review uh, through the conference. Um, but you know, clearly that's found a number of problems with, um, with TAs in spite of the growth of open access output. As I read the report, there were, there were a couple that hit me. Um, one was this sort of um, recent resurgence in, or at least sort of retention of closed articles. Um, the fact that the UK's proportion of hybrid articles is more than double the proportion in the rest of the world. But I think the key one for me was that based on the journal flipping rates that were observed between 2018 and 2022, it would take at least 70 years for the big five publishers to flip their TA titles to, to fully open. And so the, the report's recommendation in, includes this um, renewed focus on equity and non-APC models. You know, there are a number of models emerging for that, not only the ones that, that PLOS has been developing, but subscribe to open um, and in some cases, diamond open access. I, I, you know, I say I say in some cases about diamond because I think there is there is still a sort of significant question mark for me over the sustainability for for diamond models over the long term, unless we're able to sort of deliver a much more radical shift in in funding flows. Um, so, you know, for libraries, I think you know a lot of the focus has been on working with APCs and switching um, administrative ex infrastructures to support APCs and, and, and TAs. But as more publishers are coming into the marketplace with non-APC based models, I think there's, there's some struggle to be able to sort of turn systems and so on in the direction of some of those more inclusive models. And that takes me to my second question, which is how are we really going to deliver on global equity? As you know, as gold open access has taken the has become the dom dominant model, I think that the the inbuilt inequities in the system have exploded exponentially, and they've shut out large communities, especially in the global south. We've seen waivers emerge as a solution, but they're not only sus unsustainable for small and mid-sized publishers like PLOS; they fail to meet the equity standard. And what do I mean by that? I mean that. Simply put, I don't think they address the systemic structures that need that lead all of these authors to need waivers in the first place. Waivers themselves are structured to ask most of those in need of systemic change to jump through a whole series of hoops that those in privileged communities never see. In, back in the subscription model, the, the lack of transparency around pricing meant that it was easy for publishers to roll all the costs associated with publishing into a single opaque price. That included the cost of reading for those who didn't pay a subscription. It included the cost of publishing for those who couldn't afford to make a direct contribution. But as we're sort of locking into this transactional per unit pricing model, it's blown that apart. And understandably, often due to sort of institutional and budget pressures, libraries have been really focused on value for their institution. But this old model in which the richer institutions and countries ultimately subsidize reading and publishing for those less well off has gone and we haven't yet found anything to replace that. My final question is about the role for research libraries in planning for and shaping this open science future. 
Yeah, I think there's some more transactional answers to this question. The work that we see libraries doing around supporting open data policies, for example, and data management is, is a great example of that. But I think what I'm really thinking of is how libraries need to be a really key player in making sure that in 20 years time, we're not having the same conversation about open access, about open science that we're now having about open access. And this was this was a real concern that we hold that we heard across all of those stakeholder groups I was talking about just now in our research. There was a real fear that as we move towards open science, it's going to lead to further land grabs, if you like, by large publishers who are seeking to control yet more of the research enterprise. And so I think we really have to have our eyes on the long game here. Libraries are key partners in advocating for a shift from commercial control of scholarly communication to models that are really better aligned with the core values of research and science. I think you know, you're all in a position to be advocates at your institutions and beyond in a number of ways, you know, looking at expanding your role in upstream in the research life cycle, advocating for responsible research assessment initiatives that open um, practices and supporting conversations about open research practices too. You know, I, as I mentioned at the beginning, I've, I've been with the MIT libraries for the first part of this week, as I'm sure some of you are aware, they're moving forward with, with a pretty bold move in this area. They've now been out of contract with Elsevier for four years, and they're preparing to reinvest those savings in line with the goals of the MIT libraries framework, um, which seeks to, and I'm going to quote this directly here, I won't remember it exactly, it seeks to move the entire scholarly communications landscape closer to the scholar-led open and equitable environment that promises to enhance opportunities for collaboration and speed in the accumulation of knowledge and insight. And so while I, I fully understand that not all libraries have the same position or the same privilege that MIT does, at the same time, I think this is a pretty courageous initiative and it, it, it's one example of what might be possible with a more radical rethinking and something that will hopefully pave the way for others. And so, as I've noted through this talk, that the scholarly publishing industry itself has, to, I, in my view, has to embrace more radical change. And that ultimately means letting go of our distorting incentives of profits and prestige. I think we're now at the perfect time to capitalize on the progress that we've seen through open access and open science through, through the COVID years, and to think about how we deepen interconnections, we align our infrastructures and our policies. The pandemic showed us really what can be possible when we move together with this real sort of clarity and, and singular purpose. And I think as I've been clear today, publishers have an opportunity and a responsibility to act at this moment. But I think it's a responsibility that we share with other stakeholders in the system. And, you know, in, in my mind, libraries have a broad scope of skills, expertise, and I think from the librarians I talk to, a real passion to partner in the ambitions that I've outlined today. So I think that if we're all able to act boldly together in this way, we can ensure that, you know, the legacy of the pandemic isn't just about what science can do, but it's really a reminder for us of how science should be done. And with that, I will, I will close and stop sharing my screen and we can open up for questions. Thank you, Alison. Gosh, I've written so much down. Thank you for allowing us to end this conference on uh, with such a, a breath of fresh air, actually. I, I've Particularly since the last session, somebody in the room that I was listening to, it talked about it being a bit gloomy and it was very much about transition <laughs> agreements. And, um, you, you know, it, it's just so nice to be reminded and told about the PLOS guiding principles and the interventions and the policies that you've put in place. Um, I, I could have done without the three questions at the end because that brought my anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, that's, no, no, that's fine because they are, you know, they're things that we've been asking ourselves throughout the conference. I think, you know, you know, the, the traditional agreements. Yeah, we need to walk away. What the we is, is, is interesting. I think how we walk away, how you define that, whether it's consortia, individual institution, at a, at a national level, at an international level. But what next is also needs, we need yeah. to think about, you know, what, because, you know, on a purely practical level, we don't all keep the budgets that we might save. You know, it's not as yes. easy to invest. Yeah. And these are all the conversations that we yeah. roll around all the time. Um, but actually, I, I'm, I'm already going down into the deep. <laughs> 
right? <laughs> Whoa, the, the transition agreement issue and the UK. But actually, I think it's important that we try and think, you know, it's important that we try and think globally, as, as you mentioned in your presentation. So that's 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 great. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions that's cut, that have come in, so I, 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 I must ask those first for you. One of them is around the comment you made earlier in, the, in your session around trust in science. Mm -hmm. Let's get the AI out of the way. So with the rise of generative AI and some fairly high profile examples of it clearly being used in journals, because you, um, uh, I think you referred to that, what risk do you think AI posed to this trust in the robustness and reliability of science moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good question and it's one that we are spending a lot of time talking about and, and thinking about at PLOS. And I mean, I think there are sort of two sides to the coin here, that's the challenge. So, um, you know, we have adopted the policy that has been, um, you know, really sort of put together by COPE, the Committee on Publication Ethics that most yeah. um, publishers belong to. And so, you know, we allow the use of AI in, in authorship, but it has to be declared and the AI cannot be an author because there's no accountability there. And the reason I think one of the reasons why it's really important to allow use of it is um, for authors whose first language isn't English. And so it really helps to level the playing field when it comes yeah. to review for those authors. So, mm -hmm. so I think it's important not to lose sight of the fact that there are some positive aspects to, to what AI can, can do for us in the publication process. That said, I mean, we have certainly, you know, you've all, most people have probably seen the picture of the rat and all of the other things that have happened recently with, with, with sort of AI and so on and, and paper use. And so I think what's happening there is ultimately something of an arms race. We're trialing a number of different um, AI tools in our publications ethics teams that are really looking at sort of screening papers when they come in so that we can get a better idea of has AI been used uh, there are some new um, AI tools that are looking at image manipulation, which is a big issue in some of the biomedical sciences. And so there are ways in which we can sort of start to screen some of that out up front. But I, I do think there's there's a real risk there. And it's one of the things that really is going to require publishers to invest more money in research integrity and publication ethics. We added four people to our team this year, um, which is, you know, for a publisher our size is not insignificant. There are a number of um, you know, there are quite a few cross industry initiatives um, on this as well. But um, yeah, I think it's a, it's it's a risk for us in scientific publishing, as it is, I think, what much more broadly in understanding, you know, the trustworthiness of the content that we're looking at. OK, so I wonder if I could just ask you a quick question. I realise, you know, you used to work at the University of California, California yeah. Press. So this this is this is a bit arts and humanities. But one, yeah. of, one of the things that just come out in the UK here is, is, a, is a, a consultation, UKRI consultation. Um, uh, and um, uh, for, about the ref and, and one of the areas of disquiet come from our arts and humanities colleagues. And that's about um, uh, uh, what their, might, their material might be used for in an open world. Um, and it, it's come across, it's coming out quite strongly at the moment in yeah. terms of the distrust of, of open. Um, yeah. uh, and I just wondered if you had any comment on that. Um, I, I know you come from, it's, it's a science background, but whether there's anything that you have come across in terms of um, uh, that argument against open science. Yeah, I mean, I, I have heard, I definitely heard that argument. And I think, you know, I mean, we it's come up for us at PLOS as well recently. One of the things we discovered in the, the New York Times is suing chat GPT. And one of the things we discovered yeah. um, in, in the filing of that lawsuit is that PLOS content is the seventh largest body of content in the training data for Plo chat GPT. Um, and I, I sort of had kind of mixed feelings about that. I mean, in some <laughs> ways, Thank goodness it's high quality research content, mm -hmm. most of what's out there on the internet. Um, but I do think that there's then the, the question that we run into is one of attribution because we use a CC by license, but yeah. that requires attribution. And what, what does attribution mean mm -hmm. um, in a large language model? Mm -hmm. um, there was actually some interesting conversation about this um, at the MIT libraries meeting that I was at earlier this week, where they were talking about their collections and what their responsibility was in terms of allowing their collections to be used or not yes. as training yeah. data for large yeah. language models. Yeah. What do citations look like? Is it yeah. a responsible use mm -hmm. of that content? And how do you define 
what a responsible use is. Mm. So I think there's still a lot of open questions about that to, mm. to be answered. Um, and I, I don't I don't think there's a single one size fits all on that. It was interesting. I mean, the other thing um, during that meeting was we we had a panel of um, faculty uh, to talk to about sort of, you know, how the, how the library was doing and so on. Um, but there were a couple of people there, um, one in particular who, yes, she's a she's a big advocate of open science. She's on the Center for Open Science board with me. Um, but her view as a scientist was that she realized that by making all of her content open, there would be some misuse of it in an open world mm. but she would far rather that than keeping than everything hidden on a different that, yeah you know that, that not everybody is going to feel that way no. uh, and i think there are there are still we're still so early with these systems that i think there are a lot of unanswered questions yeah 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 i didn't expect you to answer that one but yeah. I, <laughs> I wish I had the <laughs> in your inside okay right um, let me encourage anyone to 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 put questions into the q a please or indeed any comments or if anybody would like to come up and ask or make a comment um uh with alison here on on, on this on in online okay so um you did bring this up so and i think i know what the answer is but i'll, I'll let you answer it far more eloquently is there a danger that the preprint platforms offering new services such as journal agnostic peer review will be bought up by the big publishers investment entities yes yeah. <laughs> i mean that's the cool <laughs> one, right um yeah. and i i mean yeah and that we've seen too much of that right and mm -hmm. i i think it's one of the one of the things that sometimes frustrates me about our, mm -hmm. our little scholarly communication world is that there are you know there are so many relatively small organizations all of whom operate on a shoestring budget you know and take something like orchid i mean orchid is critical yeah. infrastructure yeah. for many of us and they yeah. operate on absolute shoestring yeah and so ultimately they, they, they too many of these because they're not properly funded end up being acquired um and i do think that there has to be a better model for us collectively to think about funding of these organizations that are that are sort of really critical and i don't think you know that whole issue of infrastructure is one that we're making some progress on but i think it's been too slow um you know the the big publishers are anything but yeah and, and you know the links to diamond as well doesn't it because that's one of the yeah. it's one of the barriers to investing further in diamond is is the sustainability of, yeah. of those infrastructures yeah. and those that those yeah. yeah okay we have some questions where from michael um who thanks you for being such an for such an eloquent articulation of the problems and potential solutions? Um, there are many different threads in the UK. Like there are many different threads that UK HE libraries can pick up individually and collaboratively. What do you think should be our number one priority? I think probably the number one priority is figuring out where you go from TAs. Yeah, yeah. Because I. I, you know, all the problems that uh, there, to me, there are just so many problems with the sort of the APC based model, mm -hmm. um, whether it's cost, whether it's equity, mm -hmm. whether it's driving mm -hmm. a business that leads to research um, integrity problems. I mean, it, it's fundamentally flawed. And so I think figuring and uh, figuring out what the answer there is, is yeah. and I. I mean, the other thing I would say there is I don't think there should be one answer. I think one of the problems that we've had is that we we often tend to try and sort of answer all of these problems with a single answer and the mm. the right model probably isn't the same for mo humanities monographs and science journals and no. other things so i think yeah. we sort of figure out at the same time you know multiple different models is impossible for anyone to manage so there's mm. there's got to be some alignment and that's where i think you know the the working group that we have with coalition s and jisk is a good example of sort yeah. of the community trying to come together to figure that out so that we do it in a way um that that's manageable for everyone i think as i said earlier on i think that we is a difficult one that what is we um or, you know what do what do we do how what's the we that's doing something boldly together or is, yeah. is, it, is, it, is, it, is it a national institution? You know, do we do this via SCONA, which is the, uh, or, or do we do this in a, in a consortia? Um, um, or is it higher than that? Is it is it is it UK, UK? It's it's a difficult one to work out because it takes it. You know, it takes it does take a certain amount of courage and bravery um, yeah. and um, being able to be aligned as well. Uh, yeah. And you, may, I must say, you did mention values in this, and I think values is incredibly important um 
uh, to help us stop to stop thinking and to stop be so obsessed about the the financial side of it because it is about it is I think going back to what we are as libraries um, uh, and that's yeah that's that's just my personal view we've got loads of questions coming in let's go so um, Martin are plus and others engaging in the likes of QS and, and the type the THE rankings machinery to push up less reliance on citations and commercial databases. So they they both use Scopus at the moment. Yeah, yeah. I, I I'm not aware that we're specifically involved in that one. I mean, there's a lot of work that we, I mean, so you know, plus we sort of see, you know, we are a publisher, but we're sort of not just a publisher. And so I think, you know, we sort of think about our our work in sort of three buckets in sort of publishing, in policy, and in in open science practice, trying to build open science practice. So sort of in the policy bucket, we we do definitely engage in a number of areas with, um, you know, the issue of um, research assessment. So, yeah. you know, we're involved here in the US, um, the National Academies has a round table that we're, we're quite involved with, mm. um, that, that's trying to sort of shift the way in which universities assess. So the number of areas we are involved, I don't think we're involved in this particular one, but yes, I, I would agree that that's, that's a, it's a kind of problem. The, the, the rankings in, just in general, I mean, it's like impact factor, right? It's, yeah. it's not helpful. Yeah. It? And it's so, as you know, as, as, as Suzanne says, it, it, our universities are so pressurized globally, I think, aren't they, by the rankings and um, they, they do, do you think they impede, do you consider them to be, to be impeding global, um, open science? I think potentially they do. I mean, it was interesting when I, I the the first MIT libraries meeting I went to a couple of years ago, um, Chris Berg was saying that one of the things that amazed and frustrated her when she first moved from Stanford to MIT is the amount of time that MIT spent in meetings trying to figure out how to get above Stanford in the rankings. Yeah. They were they were like three yeah, and yeah, four. Yeah, that happens. <laughs> and it was like the enormous amount of time that was yeah. spent. I'm trying to figure yeah. this out. So yeah, I, yeah, I think it's, I think it's yeah. It's, it's it won't great. just be we have a set. We all have benchmark institutions that we all spend. I spend a lot of time looking at graphs yeah. how our institution is doing against our benchmark institutions yeah. to the minute institute. And lots of people spend a lot of time getting that data, um, and and it, it drives so much of what we do, including our research. Yeah, yeah. Um, and where our money goes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask Jeremy's question, which is, do you think it's possible to create a set of value driven criteria that would allow libraries to be clear about publishers and partners, which would work with and that will not be viewed as as acceptable? Um, OK, so do you think it's possible to create a set of value driven criteria that would allow libraries to be clear um, about which publishers and which partners we would work with? I think it probably is I mean I think it's sort of complicated and I don't think it's always as simple as sort of for-profit non-profit no. uh, I think the world is is a little bit more complicated than that um but there are ways so you know for example um when we were working to choose the uh partners who'd work with us in that sort of GIST coalition s st um, stakeholder group there was a really there was a clear set of criteria yeah. that Develop yeah. for people to be to be yeah. part of that, in which they had to be, you know, made a sort of clear commitment to to some of these things. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's I think it's I think it's possible to do that. I mean, I've actually been talking to a couple of people over here who have um, a couple of librarians um, who have been so concerned about research integrity that they've been asking about, you know, could we develop a measure of sort of publisher integrity yes. that lets yeah. us know whether yeah. publishers really are doing all of the things they should be doing. Mm -hmm. I mean. Is ever going to have, um, you know, there will always be the occasional retraction, right? <laughs> but um, it, it shouldn't be that big. I mean, we were just uh, doing an evaluation of PLOS One recently, and, um, you know, we it looks as if we have more retractions there, but you have to look at the size of the journal. If you look at the percentage of um, articles retracted, it was 0.008%. Mm -hmm. So, you mm -hmm. know, there is there's data like that out there that I think could help with those kinds of models and so on. So yeah, I think it's a, yeah. an interesting question i can see i can see why Jer jeremy is asking that i mean it is it, it's, it's something that we potentially need to think about in terms of how we choose you know it, it's it's a it's a procurement um it's used within procurement anyway generally isn't yeah. it like, like you yeah. say you know um 
So, it, it, and I think I think it is probably because values we hold them so strongly in libraries, um, uh, and 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 it's one thing that we you know we could use alongside the financial side of things. Definitely, yeah. I'm going to ask you a big question, um, and I wonder if this might be our last question. Yeah, it can be. Let's ask the big question. Is a truly open science future realistic? <laughs> um. I mean, I think, I think there are always going to be exceptions. So mm -hmm. I, I don't think we're, I don't think we're ever going to get to a hundred percent open science across the globe. And I think one of the reasons for that, you know, right now, if you look at what's sort of happening geopolitically, yeah. um, you know, we're moving towards potential science nationalism. I mean, just looking at sort of the UK, the U S China relationships is a good example yeah. of that. Yeah. Um, you know, the return of a Trump administration would definitely sort of lock down a number of things there. I mean, things that are happening um, in other parts of the world as well. So I think there, you know, there are there are definitely issues that are sort of well beyond our our control and remit that that sort of um, act against that. Um, but I do think there's, you know, there's sort of significant moves. You know, we've just finished the year of open science here in the in the US. It's been yeah. a big priority for this administration. Um, you know, within the European Union, there's still sort of a pretty heavy focus on the value of open science. And I think they're understanding that it's not simply about all of the, the good things that we've been talking about, the values of science. It's about good science. It's about good science that we can trust, open science that others can build on, which allows for sort of innovation and economic development. So it's it, it's not simply a sort of values conversation. There's a there's a pretty pragmatic economic um, conversation about the value of open science as well and I think that's what sort of places like the European Union have really sort of picked up in um, in in their reason for for pushing it harder so yes I mean I think it's you know it'd be hard to get to everything totally open science but I think we can make a lot of progress from where we are right now.